Okay, one more moment. <clears throat> okay. Okay, great to see all of you and thank you so much for joining us for this year to start this series on Pirkei Avot. It gives me great chizuk and strength and meaning to be able to see all of you and I hope that you're safe and healthy and you're all managing well and adjusting to this new reality. And I look forward to getting back to some semblance of normal very, very soon. My Rebbe, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein's fifth yard site was several days ago. Rav Aaron was unique in that he was someone who was a paragon of intellectual achievement in Torah, but he also combined that with a special empathy and kindness to other human beings. And that combination made him a unique a tzaddik in my view. And a student once asked Rav Aaron, if a person learned one thing in yeshiva, what would you want it to be? And Rav Aaron replied, to be a Baal Chesed, to be a person of kindness. And so the Masechta that we're going to be exploring tonight for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, and for the next couple of weeks as well, is Masechta Avos that really helps us grow in empathy and kindness and in chesed. Why is this tractate called Pirkei Avot? So quickly, just three interpretations. The first is Avot, of course, means, it can mean fathers, it could also mean mothers, fathers and mothers. But one explanation is that it's the ethical teachings from our fathers, our sages, previous generations. And just like a parent for a child, so so too the teachings of our sages in this Masechta nurture our ethical and moral development. A second explanation as to why it's called Pirkei Avot, teachings of the fathers, is because it's really a guide for the fathers, for the parents. If you're blessed to be a parent or a grandparent, study this book. Because parents need to master these principles to be good role models for their children. And the third explanation of why it's called Pirkei Avot is because Avot means categories. And on Shabbat, so there are Lamet Tet Malachot, there are 39 different categories of prohibited labor. And each of which has subcategories and details. So you've kind of 39 categories and principles and everything else is subsumed in those categories. And similarly, these Torah teachings in Pirkei Avot that we're going to be learning together that many of you are familiar with, so these Torah teachings are principles and categories of ethical behavior. And so these are really the general principles and building blocks of Torah. This is the most important thing, according to Rav Aaron, to learn in Yeshiva. And so like Hillel said to the prospective convert, when he wanted to learn the whole Torah on one leg, so Shammai just sort of dis dismissed him out of hand, because how can you teach somebody the whole Torah in a half hour, you know, with one teaching? on one leg, so to speak. And Shammai dismissed him, but Hillel said to him, sani, that what is hateful to you, do not do unto another human being. And that's kind of like a rephrasing, of course, of the kamocha. And Hillel said to him, said to this conversion candidate, he said, that is all of Judaism, and the rest is commentary. Um, and those are the words that he actually used. He said, study that principle and the rest is perish, the rest is commentary. And so um, this Sefer is Perki Avot, it's teaching of, of the sages for us. It's teachings for us to be role models for our children, grandchildren, or students and friends. And number three, these are the categories of ethical and moral behavior. Now, many Jews have the practice of studying Perki Avot between Pesach and Shavuot. And from the conclusion of Pesach until Shavuot, there are six weeks. And these six weeks are weeks of growth, of uh, anticipation, of building up to Shavuot. And it actually works perfectly that there's six weeks because there are exactly six chapters in Pirkei Avot. And so we have six chapters that are studied over the course of these six weeks. In fact, there are actually five chapters of Mishnah, Pirkei Avot, is a tractate of Mishnah. The first five chapters were the original chapters of the tractate of Mishnayot. And then the sixth chapter is a collection of Brightot, which was written around the same time period of the first century, second century, the same time period as the Mishnah, but they're known as Brightot. Brightot means that it was excluded. It was not included in 
the canon of the Mishnah, and so um, it was added on. And some scholars believe that this the sixth chapter was added on to parallel the six Shabbatot between Pesach and Shavuot. And, um, and that's what many, many people do, that they learn these chapters between Pesach and Shavuot. Of course, it's appropriate to learn it all year long. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to learn the chapter of this week. The chapter of this week is chapter 4. There's been already three Shabbatot. This coming Shabbat will be the fourth Shabbat between Pesach and Shavuot. One reason why we're learning chapter 4 is because this is the chapter, again, that many others in Klal Yisrael are learning this week. And number two, because my sense is people tend to learn uh, the first chapter, the second chapter, more often they may be, you know, they don't get to the third chapter, they don't get to the fourth chapter or the fifth chapter as much. Um, although I think the things that we're going to touch on tonight are familiar to, familiar to you anyway, but I thought it was a good idea to study chapter, chapter four. Now, why do we learn Pirkei Avot leading up to Shavuot? Okay, now we understand why it's called Pirkei Avot. We understand there are six chapters to parallel the six weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. But why should, we, why should there be a special custom to learn it now during this time of year? And the Medrash Vayikra, you have it on the first source on the page. Um, hopefully you can see that where it says Medrash Rabba Vayikra. Um, give me a thumbs up if you could see it. And a thumbs up if you could hear me okay. Okay, quick sound check. Um, so the first source says that quotes Rabbi Ishmael who says, Esrim v'shisha dorot, kadma derech eretz ha-Torah. That the concept of derech eretz preceded the giving of the Torah by 26 generations. And it derives it from a pasuk. It's, you know, you might say it's a little bit of a stretch, but it's conveying the, the rabbinic conception of how important derech eretz is. And the pasuk says, in Parshat Bereshit, lishmor et derech eretz ha-chayim, that God placed, right, the revolving sword and the guards and the Kruvim outside the Garden of Eden to guard the path to the Tree of Life. Derech, Derech is an allusion to Zu Derech Eretz. And V'yachakach Eitzachayim Zu Torah. So the rabbi said, you learn from here, and it's not just that they derived it from this Pasuk, but they were trying to find the Pasuk to their idea, which is that the Derech Eretz is paramount. Derech Eretz refers to character traits, um, to good midot, to ethical and moral behavior. And the rabbis are conveying the primacy in Jewish tradition and in our lives of ethics and morality and the way we treat other people. And so, derech eretz kadma Torah, that the concept of derech eretz, derech eretz is the foundational principle of having good character traits, being careful the way we speak to one another, um, the, way we, the way we think about our behavior and um, doing chesed and being sensitive and giving space to other people's feelings and showing respect to other people and all the different ethical values and teachings that we're going to be learning tonight and in, found in Pirkei Avot, that's the foundation on which Torah is based. Derech Eretz Kadma Torah. The Pasuk says, famous Pasuk, that when the Jewish people, that one place we learn this from is from the famous Pasuk, that when the Jewish people come to Har Sinai, it says, Vayichan Sham Yisrael Neged Ahar, that the Jewish people encamped by the foot of the mountain. And the word Vayichan is in the singular, and Rashi famously, famously says that the Jewish people were Ki'ishechad Belevechad, that they were like one person with one heart when they approached Har Sinai. And because of that, that's why the word Vayichan is in the singular, that they encamped by the foot of the mountain. And what you see from here is that the prerequisite to receiving Torah is that the Jewish people be unified and be on good terms with one another. That we can only begin to have a relationship with Hashem and receive the Torah if we focus on the teachings in this Masechta, on this general principle, concepts of Derech Eretz. And so maybe this is, this is the reason why uh, I believe we have this custom to study Pirkei Avot between Pesach and Shavuot because we're, we're coming to Har Sinai we're going to be receiving the Torah. We have to grow not just in Torah scholarship, but also in terms of our character. And as you see, the Jewish people had to come together as a prerequisite for receiving the Torah. And so too, we also have to come together and learn how to have respect for one another and the way we treat one another, but also personal growth in terms of our midot to be ready for the acceptance of the Torah.
Rabbi? Yeah. Uh, it seems that with what you just said, it explains completely why we're studying it now, because isn't this the time that Talmudei Rabbi Akiva were dying because they had no respect for each other? Yeah, great, great insight. Um, great insight, which I was hoping to mention at some point, Ayala, but I might have forgotten. And that is that one of the things that we're remembering during this time period are the death of all the students of Rabbi Akiva. Uh, my theory is, and other rabbis, there are a couple other rabbis who agree, my theory is that these students were not necessarily students in the yeshiva of Rabbi Akiva, but they were actually followers of Rabbi Akiva who fought in the rebellion of Bar Kokhba against the Romans. But whether they were students in the yeshiva, whether they were warriors in Bar Kokhba's army rebelling against the Romans, um, the, the Talmud makes a comment that, they, that the, the rabbis felt and were mourning the death of those thousands of students. And the rabbis have a comment, like Ayala said, which is that they didn't show proper respect. Lo nagu kavod they didn't show proper respect and space for the other person's opinion. And so there's a few different things that kind of converge together and coalesce together. Of course, it's always important to learn about chesed, as Ravar Lichtenstein said. Number two, which is that we have to prepare ourselves for the receiving of the Torah, and Derech Eretz precedes the receiving of the Torah. Number three, as Ayala just pointed out, that's a great insight in terms of the connection to the students of Rabbi Kiva and us turning it around, us learning those lessons and showing proper respect for one another. So let's jump right in now to the Mishnah, Mishnah Dalet Aleph. And, you know, you could have a series of shiurim, a six-part series on one Mishnah. But we're going to try to do maybe one or two Mishnayot tonight. The first Mishnah in Perik Dalet. Benzoma Omer, Benzo, Benzoma says, Benzoma died at a relatively young age and he never received smicha. This is the reason why he's not called a Rav. Uh, similarly, Ben Azai was also someone who never received official ordination and so he's just called Ben Azai. Um, ben Zoma's first name happened to be Shimon, but he's, uh, he was known as uh, Ben Zoma. Ben Zoma Omer, Ben Zoma says, Ezu Chacham, who is considered a wise person? And one of the classic commentaries on Mishnah is Rav Avadah Mibar um, He was a, a, an Italian rabbi in the 15th century. He was one of the great leaders of that generation. And in the later years of his life, he actually made it to Yerushalayim. And he tried to lead to a rejuvenation of Yerushalayim in the 1400s, as amazing as that is. And so he is one of the classic commentaries on the Mishnah. And Ravad and Bartanura says that, who is the person who's deserving of praise for his wisdom? Halomen Mekaladam. It's the person who learns from other people, from every person. Shenemar mikomal amdai hiskalti, as it says, from every man or from every person, I have gained understanding. Ki edvosecha sichali, because the teachings of Hashem are part of my conversation, are pleasant to me. And Ravada Bartanura says that since this individual learns from everyone, even someone younger, even someone he perceives as maybe having less knowledge than him or her, so it's clear that he's pursuing wisdom for the right reason, right? An individual who just wants the glory, just wants the accolades, is not going to have that sense of humility to learn from others. So the person is considered wise when he learns from all other people, even someone younger, even someone who he thinks is on a lower status or less knowledgeable. Why? Because that shows that he's pursuing the wisdom for the right reasons, and he's trying to, to learn the wisdom, right? To become a better person, to understand the world, to become closer to Hashem, for all the right reasons to learn wisdom. And that's why um, the second half of the Pasuk says, Ki edvo secha I, I learned me kom alam da hiskalti. Um, I have gained understanding from everyone. Why? Because the ways of Hashem are pleasant to me. Since your teachings are my goal and desire, it's not for honor, it's not for accolades. I really desire to learn your teachings, Hashem, so I'm going to be willing to learn from everyone. Ezehu Gibor, who's considered a strong person, Hakovesh Ed Yitzra, a person who's able to subdue his inclination or to conquer his desire. 
What's the proof text? Shenemar, as the Pasuk says, you have it on your source here in source 2. Shenemar, tov erech apayim megibor. That a person who's slow to anger, a person who's able to conquer his instinct and not get, not get angry, even though there's something that it would be kind of like the normal thing to react to and respond to and to, and to be upset about, a person who's, who's, who's careful about and has a, has, is slow to anger, right? So that person is better and more impressive than a mighty warrior. Moshe Baruch a person who conquers his spirit, Milo Chedir, he's even stronger and more impressive than a person who captures a city. The third is Ezehu Ashir, Hasamech Bechelko. Who's the wealthy person? The wealthy person is the person who's happy with his or her portion. Ezehu Mechubad, who's the person who's honored? Hamechabed Esabrios, it's the person who shows honor to others. Okay, so I just wanted to run through the Mishnah first to give all of you a sense of the Mishnah that many of you are familiar with and the Maharal. So let's analyze this Mishnah a little bit and let's dig a little deeper on, on, all, these, on all these four different important items. The Maharal writes in one of his Svarim that the opening Mishnah of each parak of Pirkei Avot teaches us a general concept. In other words, the opening Mishnah of a parak is there to teach us a general foundational principle. All right, so this Mishnah, we want to pay even extra attention to the concepts that are found in this Mishnah. Rabbi Strong Mayer Lau has a beautiful sefer called Yachel Yisrael, and I'm going to be quoting from him a couple of times tonight. He says, why are these four specific items mentioned in this Mishnah? And he points out, he says, if you think about our society, the four things that are most desired, the four things that are most valued are these four items of the Mishnah. We invest a significant portion of our lives with the goal of pursuing and acquiring wisdom, strength, wealth, and honor. And some people focus more on one or two, other people focus on the other or two, right? So depending upon a person's personality and talents, so everyone's focusing on these four items out there in society. And so this is a crucial Mishnah that provides guidance for all of us as to what, should we, what we should be considering when we pursue these four universal goals. And it's teaching us really the true nature of each of these items. And in the Sefer Yachel Yisrael, Rabbi Lau has a tremendous insight. Of course, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau is the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. He was the chief rabbi of Israel for, for 10 years, a child survivor of Buchenwald, one of the youngest uh, child survivors liberated from Buchenwald. And so Rabbi Shol Meir Lau says that, power, very, very powerful insight. He says that the Mishnah is teaching us that it's within the power of every person to reach the pinnacle of these four valuable things because not everyone has 150 IQ. Not everyone has the endurance to run a marathon. Not everyone will merit to be a multimillionaire. But... But what this mission is teaching is an amazing concept, which is that every single individual has the ability, no matter whatever your IQ, no matter how big your stock portfolio, no matter how much your physical strength is, you have the ability to, to achieve true wisdom, true strength, true wealth, and true honor. These goals are in your reach, as long as you approach them with the proper spiritual and wise perspective. And it ties into the idea that, you know, very often we, we really can't control what life throws at us. But what we can control is what kind of lives do we choose to live and to lead. And certainly during this pandemic, which is just so unusual, so surreal, so difficult. But so this is something that we, that we can't control. I mean, well, there's certain elements of it and we're trying to socially distance and follow the restrictions to, to control it to the degree we're able. But a lot of this is just thrown at us and is not under our control. But what we can control is how we respond to the situation. Are we gonna try to become a stronger person, a better person, a more kind person during this period of time? So what this Mishnah is kind of touching on is that, that these are things it's, it's reframing and reshaping these concepts because if, if Chachma is brilliance, then in a certain sense, it's not in my control. If, if, um, if wealth 
you know, of course, you know, if, if wealth is a combination of factors, you know, am I going to merit, you know, the wealth of Bill Gates or, or the wealth of many others? Chances are not, and some things are just out of my control. But according to this Mishnah, it's presenting to us that every single individual has the ability to reach true wealth and true wisdom and the other items as well. And um, now it's, it's, it's not to say there's nothing wrong with physical strength and actual wealth and wisdom. And actually, I think it's a good thing for a person to pursue the kind of, you know, the traditional conceptions of these things. But by reframing it, it's teaching us what really it's all about, the way we can achieve it. And also, if we keep these things in mind, that Chachma is about learning from everyone, that strength is about overcoming our, our desire and inclination, even when difficult, that wealth is something about appreciating what we have. So this helps us deal with you know, our wisdom and our wealth, our physical, our, our wealth and our physical strength. And it helps us make sure to channel these things in a productive and constructive purpose. Of course, you know, a person is entitled, legitimate, to pursue and acquire wealth. Number one, you need to put food on the table. You need to support your family. We need money to be able to, you know, just live in this world and certainly to afford to live in Beverly Wood and to afford tuition, you need to have money. But what this Pasuk is teaching us, Ezu Ashir, is not to say that you, that you shouldn't acquire money. What it's teaching us is to have a proper perspective about the possessions that you have. And what's really interesting is that this Mishnah, so it's, it's saying that every single person has the ability to attain it. It's teaching us what's truly important. And it's really the opposite of what people would think. Am I right? So by, by Chachma, by wisdom, I would say who's the wise person? The person who's the teacher. Who's the brilliant scholar? No, it's the person who's the learner, who has the humility to learn. Who's the strong, who's the strong individual? That's the one who could overpower and control others. This is the one who, who you know, who is the dictator, the, the controller, the one, right, who, who bosses people around. That's a person who you might think has tremendous power or is the person who could bench press 300 pounds. And it says, no, the person is a gibor if he can, if he can give in if he or she can compromise, if he or she can be forgiving. The, the powerful person is the individual who you might have the power because of your position or whatever the situation, but you choose not to exercise your power. That's a sign of strength. Who is the wealthy person? I would have thought is a person who has a very um, diverse stock portfolio. No, the person is a wealthy individual if he or she is satisfied with the basics. A Hasidic Rebbe once, uh, once asked, he said, who's the person, who's richer? The person with 200, with $100, or a person with $200? Who's, who's wealthier, the person with 100 or with 200? And all the students answered, well, that's an obvious answer. The person with 200 is wealthier than the person with $100. And the Rebbe said, no, absolutely not. Because generally the way the world is that a, a person feels that he doesn't have enough. And because of that, he always wants to double his material and physical goods. And, and really, whether a person is wealthy or poor depends on what he feels he's missing. And the, the regular, the part of the human condition is that if you have 100, right, you feel like you're missing 100. If you have 200, you want to double your wealth so you feel like you're missing 200. So the Rebbe explained to his students that often the person who, is, who has 200 is, is poor, poorer than the one who has 100, right? Because he feels like he's missing more than the person with 100. And the lesson we learn from this Mishnah is to try to overcome that human instinct. It's not to just think whatever we have that we want to double, because if that's the case, then the person who's wealthier is really poorer than the other. And the key is, of course, real wealth is spiritual. It's about our inner character and it's about being appreciative, being happy, being appreciative of what we have. And of course, also, Ezehu Mechubar, who's the person who's, who's honored, right? Who's the person who has honor? So the person who has honor, I would have thought that it's the person who has awards, who has accolades, right? Who gets, who's famous. No, it's the person is honorable, if he wants other people's success.
that is, that is the first Mishnah. These are the four different items, right, which are the, the goals of life. These are the universal pursuits. In Pirkei Yavad over here is telling us that it's the opposite of what we thought they were. Um, these are so insightful, wise teachings that Ben Zoma shares with us. And if we're able to employ these as strategies, so we'll be able to, number one, pursue well, use our wealth and use our wisdom and use our strength and use our honor in constructive ways, but also achieve uh, the, true, the true nature of all these items. Let's move on to Mishnah Bays. And uh, I'm sorry in my, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm actually proud of myself if I can brag that I actually am sharing my screen. It's one of the first times I'm doing that. But in my rush to get everything in order, so I didn't put Mishnah Bays on the screen, but uh, you don't mind and you might not even have, uh, even have noticed. So um, let's move on from Mishnah Aleph to Mishnah Bet. Uh, I could pause for a quick moment if anyone wants to raise a quick a question or comment. And this way, I'll, I could also look at my notes to make sure that I covered pretty much most of the things that I wanted to cover in this mission. What, what period of time was this written? Okay, uh, Rabbi Myrna, this was written, this is the time period of the Mishnah. And so this is in, the, in around 2,000 years ago, around uh, the first century, second century of the Common Era. And the Rav Avadim of Bartonura in his commentary is in the 15th century. And the Rav Sormeyer allows insights. I quoted a couple of his, his insights um, are from our generation. The next Mishnah quotes Ben Azai. And the Mishnah says, Ben Azai Omer, Ben Azai says, Have a le mitzvah kala, that you should run to perform even a minor mitzvah. Ubarech min avera, and you should flee even a minor sin. So you should run towards a mitzvah to perform it, and you should run away from any kind of sin. Why? She mitzvah goreres mitzvah, because a mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, and an avera goreret avera, right? One mitzvah brings in its wake another mitzvah, the avera goreres avera, and one sin brings in its wake another sin. Sheschar mitzvah mitzvah, the reward for a mitzvah is a mitzvah, uschar avera avera. One interesting comment of one of the, uh, one of the commentaries says, schar mitzvah means that if you enjoy the mitzvah, mitzvah, that itself is a mitzvah. And the Sefer Egle Tal wonders, is it, is it permissible to enjoy the study of Torah? If you, if you enjoy and have a great time learning Torah, if you're just enjoying this shir so much, does that somehow detract from the purity of the act of study of Torah. And he says, he answers no. On the contrary, it, it doesn't detract, but it actually adds that when you enjoy the mitzvah that you're doing or you're um, having pleasure from studying of Torah, so then you absorb it into your character. And, and of course, right, you're going to approach it with a greater degree of enthusiasm if you enjoy it. So, sheschar mitzvah mitzvah. The enjoyment that you get for a mitzvah, simple interpretation is the reward for a mitzvah is another mitzvah. But one interpretation is sheschar mitzvah, the, the enjoyment that you have when doing a mitzvah, that itself is a mitzvah. And that reminds me of the story of a, an innkeeper whose right, who's, who's business was failing and nobody was coming into the inn and staying, staying at the inn or purchasing anything from the restaurant. And finally somebody walks in and, he's, and the innkeeper, the owner of the bar is so happy to finally have a customer. And the, and the customer comes over and says, can I have a drink and can I have a sandwich? And the innkeeper is about to serve it to him. And the traveler says, but I'm sorry, I don't have a penny to my name. Would you mind if you would give it to me just as charity because I, I can't afford it, I can't pay for it. And so the, the owner uh, pours the, the cup of beer and he's, he's handing it to the person, but as he's handing it, he's, he spills it out. Then he pours another cup of beer, and as he's handing it to the person, to the traveler, again he pours it out. The third time, again he pours it out. The fourth time, and he finally gives it to the traveler. The traveler says, thank you so very much for your kindness, but what in the world were you doing by pouring it out uh, three times? You only gave it to me on the fourth. Um, 
and and the the owner said the innkeeper said because I learned that when you do a good deed you have to be happy when doing it the first time I was very angry that I lost the business the second time I was still resentful but I was warming up to the idea the third time still I had some lingering resentment and finally I was able to pour you the cup of beer and give it to you besimcha sheschar mitzvah mitzvah when you enjoy a mitzvah that itself is a mitzvah but the simple interpretation of this teaching of Ben Azai is that you, you, that you shouldn't denigrate or dismiss even a minor mitzvah because we don't know the value of every single action and we don't know the impact. Shem mitzvah goreres mitzvah because one mitzvah could lead to another mitzvah. Well, firstly, there's intrinsic value to every good deed that you do. It's hard to know, like in, you know, in chess, you have, you know, the, the rook is is four points and the bishop is worth three points in just in terms of how we, you know, uh, compare the different pieces. Usually you don't pay, play with a point system, but there's points that the experts give to the pieces. We don't usually compare mitzvot and give it different uh, point values. So for that reason, that's why you have to observe every mitzvah and do every good deed. But Ben Azay says, in addition, mitzvah goreres mitzvah. One mitzvah could lead to another mitzvah. And I'd like to suggest that when it says a mitzvah causes another mitzvah, that what it also means is that when you do a mitzvah, you might not even realize it, but you could very well be inspiring another person to do a mitzvah. And very often, the education that takes place in our homes and our world happens when you don't realize that you're teaching and the person doesn't realize he's learning. Every one of you is a role model in what you say and how you behave. And so mitzvah goreres mitzvah. Ben Azai says, even when it's a minor thing, a mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. It's not just that it leads to another mitzvah that you're going to do, but each one of us is a role model and teacher. And by your giving, by your doing, by your, your standing up for justice, so that inspires other people to do a mitzvah. Mitzvah causes another mitzvah done by somebody else. One of my favorite stories uh, is shared by Rabbi Aaron Rakefet, who once gave a hespid, a eulogy for Joe DiMaggio. And he, he spoke about, you know, all the different things that we could learn from Joe DiMaggio. So if you're a Yankee fan, you'll like this story. If you're a baseball fan, hopefully you'll enjoy it. But, but it could be enjoyed by anyone. And so Rabbi Rakefet shared the following story that an interviewer once asked Joe DiMaggio and said, why is it that, you know, right, this, the, the all-star Hall of Famer, center fielder for the Yankees, why is it that before every inning, before every inning, give me one second, please. Okay. Why is it that before every inning, you, ru you run out to center field? You run out there like a rookie. You know, you're running out to center field. You're the highest paid ball player. You're married to Marilyn Monroe. You've made the all-star team 10 years in a row. Why do you run out there like a rookie. And Joe DiMaggio said a very powerful thing. He answered, he said, because there might be a young man in the stands who's at his very first ball game. And I want to make sure he understands that when you play this game, you have to play with enthusiasm and you have to hustle. And so I run, I rush out to the outfield because of that young man in the stands. Joe DiMaggio understood this concept that we're all role models in the way we behave. And when we do a mitzvah, it causes another mitzvah. When we hustle for something, you don't even realize it sometimes, but it'll inspire somebody else to hustle. I read an interesting story about Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, who I mentioned earlier, that, um, that a number of years ago, Julius Berman shared the story that Rav Aaron once required a medical procedure and needed to be sedated. And the, the medical procedure lasted longer than planned. They ended up having to abort the whole procedure, but that's not, not important. But when they were leaving the hospital, so they were taking the elevator, and when, when the elevator finally arrived, the doors opened, and a crowd, including Rivaron's group, moved quickly inside. And, but suddenly Rivaron changed course, and he quickly left the elevator. And the reason why he did so was because there was a service door to an adjacent bakery right next to the elevator, and a young man with a large cart was trying to maneuver and, and get out the door, which was right next to the elevator. So Rav Aaron left the elevator. He reached for the door, held it open for the young man, 
you know, who, was, who had the card until he passed through, and then he was able to return to the elevator. A few weeks later, the doctor who had accompanied Ravaron out of the hospital, in other words, the doctor who was treating Ravaron um, in the hospital and who accompanied him out of the hospital was participating in a medical convention in Vienna. And he was on a train on the way to the conference when the doors of the train opened. And on the platform stood a young woman with a baby carriage attempting to enter the crowded train. And the doctor expected somebody inside the train who was close to the doors to give the young woman a hand to be able to enter. But no one moved. And his first reaction was not to intervene. After all, he was in a foreign country wearing a yarmulke. He was trying to keep a low profile. But then he visualized the tired, weary, and sedated Ravar on Lichtenstein running to help the young woman with the cart. And the doctor thought about Ravaron, hurried over to help the young woman with the carriage. And so even though the doctor never studied in Yeshiva Haratzion, he, he too is considered a student of, of Ravaron Lichensin. And the reason why I share this story is because it's, it's, it's a minor mitzvah, right? Like Ben Azai says, it's a Haviratzla mitzvah kala. You should rush to perform even a minor mitzvah, even holding the door open for someone is something that you might say is something mundane, it's minor, it's little. But mitzvah goreres mitzvah, the minor mitzvah of holding the door, was goreret, it led to another mitzvah of the other doctor also opening the door for a woman with a baby carriage. And we too have the ability to incorporate that into our own lives, to recognize that what we do has, makes a difference, and it, it has an impact upon others that we don't always even realize. And if we think about that we're a distinguished, you, all of you, is a, you're, each of you is a distinguished individual in the community, you're a respected member of Beth Jacob and Los Angeles. And so, you know, when you do something, you know, people are, people are watching, people are listening, and it's something, a powerful thing to keep in mind that what you do makes a difference. I received a beautiful email yesterday from an individual who was a COVID patient, who was a uh, COVID patient, and uh, he received some support from, from the Shul Chesed Fund. And uh, yesterday I got an email from him. He happens, to, he happens to be a physician, and thankfully he recovered from the virus. He's back at work helping patients, and he was, he was sending me back, and he wanted to make a contribution back to the Shul of the support that he received from the shul. And mitzvah goreris mitzvah, one deed leads to another good deed. It was just a touching, touching email and gesture to receive from this individual. I'd forgotten that we'd even helped him in any way. Um, actually, I think it was that we sent him food for his family over Shabbos or something like that. And, uh, and it was just a nice, pleasant surprise about one mitzvah leading to another mitzvah and the concept of paying it forward. But there's another lesson, I think, in this Mishnah. And the lesson is when this concept of mitzvah goreris mitzvah, that one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, what does it really mean? And what is it teaching us for our lives? And there's a beautiful Rashi, there's a beautiful Rashi in Parsha Kitetse, because the opening topics in the Parsha is it first talks about um, a captive woman, then it speaks about a man who has two wives, one who is beloved, one who is less beloved. And then the third topic of the Parsha is if a person has a rebellious child, Ben Sora or More, and the, and the challenges and troubles of all of that. And then the fourth is that if a person is a capital uh, criminal, so it speaks about if, if he's executed by the Beitin, so even he has to be buried because he's created in the image of God. It seems like four disparate topics. It seems like four disjointed topics to open the Parsha. And what Rashi says is that there is a connection between these four topics because if really the Torah doesn't want us to take this captive woman, even if you follow the procedure that's laid out by the Torah, and if a person is not able to conquer his desire, if a person is not able to be Kovach Hasidra, and he takes this captive woman, so then there's going to be problems in the home. There's going to be one wife who's beloved, one wife who is less beloved. And then it could be that you're going to have problems with the children and it's going to break up the family dynamics. And then who knows, 
that child, one of the children, could commit a terrible crime. And so you have this progression of a downward spiral leading this person to, you know, just to, to uh, you know, bad, bad results. And then later in the Parsha, it speaks about, um, later in the Parsha, so then it speaks about a, a person who builds a house and if he has a mezuzah and then he builds a fence. So, and Rashi again says that if he, if he follows the mitzvah, that he has a mezuzah and he, and he builds a fence and he, and he follows those steps, then he's going to receive the blessing at the end. Mitzvah goreres mitzvah, one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah and one avera leads to another avera. And what I think this is getting at, and I once learned this from one of my teachers, that really an individual can be on the side of mitzvah or you could be on the side of avera. What is our direction? What is our general thrust in life? We know where we are, but where are we going? And so when it says that there's a concept of mitzvah goreris mitzvah, that one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, one act leads to another act of growth, and on the other side, avera leads to avera, goes in a downward spiral, what it's teaching us is that God doesn't require us to change our life in one fell swoop. Hashem wants us to be on the path of good. Be a person of growth. Be part of a community of growth. And, and focus on doing incremental change. And as long as you're on that path of mitzvah, you're headed in the right direction. And so I think that maybe that's what Ben Azai is teaching us, um, that Ben Azai is teaching us that, um, that a person should be on the path of mitzvah and of course, not, God forbid, on the path of Avera. Let me, just, um, let me just end with just quickly touching on, touching on the, um, the third Mishnah. And because I also wanted to share a quick story relating to it. Let's see if I could, uh, if I could bring it up here. So the next mission just says, and we'll end with this, says, Hu haya omer, al baz l'chal adam, that a person should not be scornful of any other person. So this is Ben Azai. So the first Mishnah was Ben Zoma with the four items, which is a totally revamped and revitalized way of viewing those different items. Ben Azai now teaches us in terms of being on a path of good, running even for the small things, number one for ourselves, for our development, but also uh, to impact others. And now we have the third mission. I'm sorry, I don't have this uh, share screen. I, I don't have this. It would take me a couple minutes to get it, so I'll just, I'll just read it to you quickly. Hu haya omer, al baz adam. Ben Azai says that a person should not be scornful of any, of any individual. Vi al maflig l'chal davar, and you should not be dismissive of anything. Right? Sometimes they're individuals that you kind of, you know, they're marginalized, they're on the periphery, you know, you, you don't, uh, they're not part of your circles and you don't give them as much attention. And then there are things in this world also that you don't think have value. Well, listen to what Ben Azai says. He says, She'en lecha adam, she'en lo shah. You do not have a single person who does not have his hour. Every single person has his 15 minutes of fame. Every person has his, his time, his moment, and has his role in the world. Ve'en lecha davr, she'en lo makam. And you do not have anything that, that does not have its place. And I'll just share with you a story to wind down here. Ravari Levine was the Ravari Levine was a was a tzaddik. Um, uh, there's a book called I think it's called the Tzaddik in Our Time, which is a beautiful book about Ravari Levine. We we hosted his uh, grandson Rabbi Benji Levine in our community, um, Myrna and a couple others on this on this year participated in a tour. You remember that? It was just a, such a marvelous, marvelous tour that we had in Israel. And what was amazing is wherever we went in Yerushalayim, uh, Rabbi Benji Levine would always have, have to interrupt because he wanted to say hello and share a kind word with every single person. There's Abby. Abby's on. Abby. Abby was on the trip. And I'm sorry if I'm leaving out anyone else who was, who was on the trip together with us. Um, so Rabbi Benjamin Levine then was invited back to our community. And uh, Benjamin Levine's grandfather, Ravari Levine, 
Are Susan and David too? Hey, Susan and David too. That's right. Susan and David yes, too. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't see you, Susan, but I see I, your name I now. I know for some reason I don't know how to get on to the camera, but the way I look is better not to be seen. <laughs> right. Uh, right. <laughs> you, you always look good, Susan. Okay. So anyway, Rabbi Rabbi Arya Levine, Rabbi Benjamin Levine's grandfather, is Rav um, Rav Arya Levine. And Rav Arya Levine was known as a, as the Tzaddik of Yerushalayim. And Rav Arya Levine, who was the um, was the Mashkiach at Yeshiva Seitz Chaim, was once standing outside during recess and he was watching the children play. And one of the other teachers saw Rav Arya Levine and said, "You know, what are you what are you looking at? What do you find so interesting?" And Rav Arya invited him to come and watch a couple of the children who were playing at recess. And after five minutes, Rav Arya asked the other teacher, "He says, Nu." No, what do you see? And the teacher replied, I noticed, so the other teacher said, I noticed that David was running around without a keep on his head. And Moshe's tzitzis were not long enough. And so the teacher then asked Rav Aryeh, and what did, what did you see? And Rav Aryeh Levine answered, I saw that David looked a little bit skinny and I need to check on, I need to check out what's going on in his home. And I saw that Moshe's shirt was torn and tattered, so I have to make sure to bring him a new shirt. And so every person has a different perspective. And Rav Ayer Levine was the individual who cared about, who cared deeply about every single person, no matter young or old, righteous, less righteous, because why? Because every person has his place, every person has its hour. And I think that's a nice story to end. I see Alice Schoenfeld was also on our trip. My mom, my mom was, was also with us. And so that wraps up the, the, the few shiurim, uh, I mean, the few Mishnahit that we learn. We put it all together that the first Mishnah teaches us about the goals of life and how we should approach them. Then we learned in the second Mishnah about mitzvah goreris, mitzvah goreris mitzvah. So the first Mishnah is the goals of life. Second Mishnah is mitzvah goreris mitzvah, which is the path that we have to take to, to lead and reach those goals. And finally, as you walk along that path, give space to others, um, show respect and kindness to every single person, show respect also to God's world because everything has its place as well. And if we do that, you know, if we give respect to others, we bring people along with us on our path, hopefully we'll grow um, and reach our best selves, reach our potential and develop a very close relationship with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thanks yeah. very much. Hi, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. What was the name of the book about R.E.A. Levine? Um, a, a Tzaddik in Our Time. Tzaddik in Our Time. You remember that Torah, Myrna? That was something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Next week. Okay, ne that's right. Next week at 8 o'clock. Hopefully I'll see you by Zoom or maybe even across the street before then. But I invite you back to part two. So the layout of Next this week. Zoom seems to be different from our other classes. Is this an upgraded Zoom? I mean, is there, what's different about it? Okay, I'm glad you asked, Myrna. It was an upgraded shear. <laughs> It's always or, or it's always or not. I was going to say it was an upgraded cheer or not. Always. Um, I don't think it was really an upgraded platform. It could be. I don't know. Maybe there's. Uh, we had a nice group tonight. We had. Um, we had so many. So maybe oh. that's we changed the layout on your screen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening. Say hello. To I, you. Please, Hi, consider, please consider yourself personally recognized. I'm mentioning your name now, but I, I can't say your name because then I'm going to leave out some other names, but I see you. And thank you so much for joining this year. And hopefully as we grow together, you're welcome to share any comment by chat or to email me any insights so I can learn from you. Okay, Yvette just popped on there. So I'll give her a shout out. Hi, Yvette. Hi, Yvette. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much everyone for joining and learning together. I hope that you and your family are safe and well. And uh, keep going strong. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye, Alice. Bye. 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 Alice gets a shout out. Good night. Miss you. Bye. Good night. Night, Take Colin. Care, See you. You're you get credit for, wow, almost midnight on the East Coast. Right. You were terrific. Always a pleasure seeing you, listening to you. It was wonderful. Thanks, Mom. Yeah. You're my biggest fan. I am your number. <laughs> and I'm happy to have a conversation with you while others listen in. <laughs> Hi, Rav Simcha. Hi, Michelle. How you doing, Michelle? Thank you for coming. It was great. Thanks, Mom. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You also, wow. I really appreciate you joining. So nice, uh, so nice to see you. Martin, Martin, how are you? Martin? Martin is you. Martin, how you doing? Yes, yeah, so unmute himself. 